What's happening, everybody? And thanks for tuning in to episode 253 of the Crash Bang Boom podcast with drummer Brandon Barnes of Rise Against. Brandon's been touring and recording with the band for over 20 years, and we get into them working with the production duo of drummers Bill Stevenson and Jason Livermore, as well as the single record they recorded with producer Garth Richardson and some of the tours they've done with bands ranging from Sick of It All to the Foo Fighters and everything in between. So I hope y'all dig it. Today's episode is sponsored by my man Carson Gant, a.k.a. OneUpLoops.com. Carson and his team spent a preposterous amount of time recording over 400,000 shaker tambourine and hi-hat loops at every possible tempo and multiple fields with incredible mics and outboard gear for you to pick and choose. It's organized for you to find exactly what you need with just a few clicks and everything feels and sounds incredible. You can sign up for free to check it out and gain full access to all 400,000 loops starting at $5.99 a month. No download limits, whatever you want, whenever you want. New loops, one shots, and drum breaks are being added weekly. So check it out at oneuploops.com. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and Amazon Music Podcast, to name a few. Feel free to check out any of the previous 250 plus episodes. Give me a like and or a subscription and or a positive review as the support is appreciated. Alrighty then. Here we go. Brandon Barnes, Rise Against. Play in the Aragon Ballroom December 10th for those of you in the Chicago area. Crash bang boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. Yes! <laughs> All right, I'm here with Brandon Barnes of Rise Against. 20 some odd years of playing in this band. No small feat there, man. How you doing, Brandon? I'm very good. How are you? Doing pretty good myself, man. I'm uh, I'm excited to catch up with you. It's always cool uh, talking to somebody that's that's been in a band as long as you have that started out in sort of a, a, an interesting and kind of bizarre time in what was the early 2000s as well. So we can get into all that good stuff. But uh, in the meantime, man, uh, new record, Nowhere Generation. Uh, once again, working with legendary drummer Bill Stevenson and Jason Livermore on the production end. How was this experience of, of tracking for this record and, and ultimately getting this record together, man? You know, Bill and Jason, they're both drummers. And so uh, <laughs> it's interesting recording with two drummers because there's a wealth of ideas. Yeah. And we kind of battle it out and figure out, we call it the bag of tricks, you know, <laughs> beats, you know, something to make it interesting, but not overplay. And But it's great. I love those guys. You know, they're both from the punk world, from yeah. the rock world. 100%. You, you don't have to explain to them kind of what you're going for. Right. So, you know, I've definitely recorded many other places and, you know, sometimes there's a, some miscommunication happening, but you know, with those guys, you know, they're my dear friends. I've known them forever and we just have fun and mess around and throw everything we got at it until it works, you know? Nice. Where did y'all record this record or where, at least where did you track drums? Did you track drums separately and then record elsewhere? We actually record in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is close to where I live. Yeah. That's where the blasting room is, which is Bill's studio. Nice. And uh, which is nice being close to home. And we we tracked everything there. Yep. Awesome. Guitars, vocals, bass, drums. I've spoken to quite a few bands where there was a pretty significant delay because of COVID when, especially if you're a band that's looking to tour in support of releasing a record. And I mean, I talked to bands that, that tracked had everything borderline mixed and ready to go in March, uh, March, April of 2020 thinking, ah, you know, we'll still be able to put it out this summer. And then, you know, they sat on it for a year and a half. Was that necessarily the case with, with, with this record? Yeah. So because of COVID we, you know, we had to sit on the record for a while. Um, and actually we had people come from our label and our managers fly out to kind of listen to some of the tracks that we had finished. And we all, you know, gather in the room and we're all kind of just making small talk. And they're like, yeah, um, you've heard about the coronavirus. And we're like, yeah, we've been seeing it on the news. And they said, well, at DIA, Denver airport, we saw a bunch of people starting to wear masks. And we were like, oh, wow, this is getting serious. So just a few weeks later, it was like, we were nearing like shut down you know, right. no touring, no shows, no nothing. So it was kind of the day our label came to listen to the record was when it was really starting to get bad. So yeah, we waited for months and months and months to put the record out, which is unfortunate because recording's fun, but it can be stressful. And you, we work on these songs for weeks and weeks and months, and we finally get them ready and record them. And then it's like, all right, wait, right. 
<laughs> you finished all this product, all this thing, these songs you were proud of, worked hard on, now just sit for a year. So it was a little disappointing, but you know, um, it's out now. Yeah, Everything's man. Everything's fine. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, uh, as did I, both uh, sort of the band working with Bill Stevenson and obviously, you know, as, as a guy who worked with all the Descendants, Black Flag. I'm sure the dude's got no shortage of stories, uh, so many of which that I would love to hear. But I guess tell me a little bit about the first time that you worked with him. And were you nervous sort of that with that first time of working with him? Yeah. I mean, first time going into the blasting room, you know, it's Bill Stevenson and yeah. he's, you know, this legendary drummer. And, you know, that's like when you get your punk rock starter kit, when you're a kid, it's like, you get a black flag record, you get a misfits record, you get a, you know, <laughs> totally. it's like, one, he's like one of the dudes, like the original guys. So hundred percent, you hear stories about Bill um, being really good in the studio and just a great drummer. So it makes you a little nervous, but actually it was really fun. It was really comfortable. Bill actually tracked all my drum tracks. Um, like, he's the guy sitting on the other side of the glass hitting the button the whole time nice and uh yeah it was a really good time it was probably 2002 i think was revolutions per minute right and it was our second record and uh, yeah it came out great but yeah. yeah there's always a little bit of nerves when you're working with a guy with that pedigree you know what i mean absolutely uh well what's your story of how you got in the band and uh i mean how long had you been playing drums prior to joining the band you know, I started playing drums when I was a kid. I was probably maybe seven or eight years old. Um, my grandparents are musicians and my mom's a musician. So my grandparents, um, real quick, they were like, my grandfather was named Will Back and he was on like MCA records back in the day. And he, he was a touring musician. Nice. And so was my grandmother. Wow. Her name was Eunice Clark. And she had a radio show like coast to coast when she was like 18 or 19 years old. Wow. She sang on the radio. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and, she, and they ended up getting married because she sang in his band and they ended up falling in love and whatever, getting married. So wow. um, they, their drummer was actually my mom's cousin, who's a really good drummer. <laughs> and he gave me like an old beat up like starter kit when I was like seven or eight years old. My mom hooked it up somehow and it was called a Tempro Pro. Oh, yeah. It's funny. I found a floor tom in a drum shop like a few months ago. You know, you never see them. Right. And they're really cheap, you know. Uh -huh. but, but I bought it. It was just a floor tom, but I bought it just because it's the first time I've ever even seen one since right. I was a kid. No heads on the bottom, just beat down. But, you know, I, I did the, my best with it and played that thing all the way till I was probably like 15 or 16. Um, but yeah, my mom just, she let me pick an instrument, was really supportive. And she's, my mom's a piano teacher as well. And she gave me piano lessons. So she was always pushing the music on us. That's awesome. It's funny you mentioned buying a drum just for the sake of sort of reclaiming your first kit. I recently did that in the last year, some 30 years after I got my first kit. The first kit of which I sold to this used car salesman. It was a complete pain in the ass. And I just discounted it to get him <laughs> out of my apartment at the time. But uh, at, recently I bought a whole nother kit. Uh, that was the same one. It was one of those wood, uh, wood finished Tama superstars from the eighties. And that was my first kit. And I was like, I'm getting another one. And I got it. And I'm like, it's actually been killer connecting to it. I forgot how great the thing sounded. I was fortunate to have like a really awesome kit. Not that I knew how to tune it, set it up or any of that shit. I was, mm -hmm. everything was pretty much wrong yeah. when I was first starting out. But now that I've uh, got a little more know-how reconnecting with that original line has been awesome. I'm so glad I did it. <laughs> Man, those old Thomas with the huge deep toms, remember? Yeah. I, I feel like all the 80s, 90s Tama kits, even the rock stars and all those, the swing stars, they had those big Dave Grohl style toms. Big ass power toms. Yeah. Yeah. We had one of those in my middle school <laughs> and we used it for jazz band, which was funny because it was like such a rock and roll drum set. Oh, that's hilarious. But God, cannons. And they they sound good. I love those old Tom. I, I was with Tama for, you know, probably 18 years or something. Wow. Um, but I, I switched over to DW recently, but nice. Love my Thomas. Yeah. With, uh, with some of the tours that the band's done throughout the years, and I know there's been quite a few and some of which that have been pretty, pretty extensive from what I understand. Uh, what were some of the longer tours that you recall being on? When we first started, we would go on these long tours, you know, band tours that would go on for a month or two, one, two days off. Uh, -huh. And those were the ones that seemed long, the ones where there were no days off, you know, even right. if it was four weeks, I mean, you play every single day. Yeah. We really hit the road a lot for probably the first 10 years. Yeah. 
the longest tours, I mean, honestly, we would only come home for like a week or two, half the time in between tours. So, I mean, we were sort of on tour for like 10 years straight. Oh my God. It was insane. Yeah. We hit it hard. Now, you know, we all have kids, three of us out of the four of us have kids and we try to have two weeks off, three, yeah. four weeks off between each tour for sanity and we can see our families. But yeah, I don't know. We did a lot of real long tours. Um, my daughter was born and just a few weeks later, we did a tour that was Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand. I think we did Japan and then Europe on the tail end of that before we came back home. Wow. And so my daughter was just, you know, a newborn, like the size of a burrito. And basically I remember coming, I was living in Chicago at the time and coming through customs. My wife was just standing there on the other end and she was like this large fat baby. <laughs> right. Just, I mean, hadn't seen her in probably almost two months, you know? Right. So some of those old tours that were getting close to the two month mark, those were intense, but yeah it was fun it was worth it pre having children which is its own balancing act for sure uh just coming home period uh having sort of been living this ongoing sort of blur of a nomadic lifestyle was it hard just to adjust to that alone to being semi-stationary and living something of a pedestrian lifestyle again you know yeah it's always a change and like I said, we toured so much. There was a point where I just had a storage unit in Chicago with just my stuff. Wow. And if I came home, I would just like stay at a buddy's house for a little bit and then get back in the van. Like we toured a lot, like a lot. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Maybe too much. Yeah. But no, yeah, no, there was definitely a, uh, a time where I had a storage unit, not even a house. Right. Did you experience any sort of drumming related injuries with, uh, with all that repetition? that you then at some point or another had to deal with? Yeah, I I grew up in Colorado snowboarding uh, a lot. And so I broke my arm. I'm I'm I play right handed even though I'm a lefty, oh. but my snare my snare drum arm I've broke a few times. I have some plates oh. in there. And so that will get sore every once in a while because I've got some some hardware in there, but nothing major. Damn, dude. Well, you mentioned you, uh, Chicago. Where are you now? Are you in Colorado now? I do. Yeah, I live in uh, near Denver. How do the winters treat your arm even when you're not playing? It's fine. I'm used to it. I grew up here, so I'm used to the winter. Gotcha. I know some people say if they have a plate in their arm, when it gets cold, it hurts yeah. or whatever. <laughs> I don't notice that. But Crazy. Who were some of the bands that yeah. y'all did, did some of those tours with sort of early on in the early 2000s? Because it's kind of a strange period, like I was alluding to earlier, where, you know, grunge had sort of came and gone. And I don't know what was going on mm -hmm. with sort of modern radio, but it felt as though everyone was just sort of harping on these sort of regurgitated and exhausted templates of, of, of rock at the time. And I just kind of tuned out to, to the whole thing. And at the time, you know, bands like, uh, like ISIS and cave in and Dillinger escape plan and botch and early Mastodon, mm -hmm. there was kind of that stuff happening in the early 2000s. So I would, I, I was already there for kind of the grunge thing. And then two, 2000, again, it, it was just a weird time for rock. And yeah. I kind of gravitated towards this other thing that was happening. That was really cool and going to see those bands live. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what were, what were you sort of into uh, any scenes or any bands that were you into when you joined the band, like in the early, early 2000s? You know, I was into a lot of stuff. You mentioned cave -in. Yeah. They actually had a great record that came out in the early 2000s. I can't remember the name, but probably the very first one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a great record killer. You know, we were touring, we were on, we signed to fat records right out of the gate. And so you asked about bands we were touring with, you know, sick of it all had just signed to fat and our first uh, Europe tour, we went with sick of it all. Awesome. Yeah, it was great. They kind of showed us the ropes, you know, it was the first time I'd ever been over there. And I'd nice. actually went to Japan with my old band as well, but I'd never been to Europe. Oh, damn. Yeah. I mean, you name it, no effects, um, you know, Lawrence arms, sick mm -hmm. of it all. Yeah. Anti-flag. I mean, a bunch of like, you know, faster punk type bands, Pennywise, mm -hmm. uh, all that type of stuff, you know, um, doing a lot of the Euro festivals with like Lagwagon and a lot of the faster, like fat records bands. Right. Um, cause that's, cause that was kind of our sound at the time. If you listen to unraveling, I mean, it's ripping fast. Right. 
it has that beat we call the no no effects beat you know that 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 that, 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 that super fast beat sure. i mean the the record's blazing fast you know so yeah we kind of fit in with those um type of bands and then you know we could play with hardcore bands too we could play with you know like a cave or something you know we kind of our singer tim he has a real melodic voice so but he also can scream and so i think it it allowed us to play kind of hardcore shows but then we could jump on a punk show and play, you know it allowed us to play in a lot of different scenes, which I think helped us get bigger, you know? Right. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Cave In because this kind of ties back to one of the discussions that I had with the with their drummer. They put out uh, their record Antenna and it was on a major label record, l- record label rather. And the following one, they did it with Andrew Snyder, who was a little bit more of like a noise rock guy, awesome producer, awesome dude uh, for the Perfect Pitch Black record. And, uh, and when I spoke to him about that, he said, you know, being on the doing the major label thing and sort of peeking behind the curtain, so to speak, it was was not the easiest thing to do. And then once they got back kind of more on their terms, they felt like everything flowed. They loved the production. They loved the process and everything else about it. So I guess when y'all worked with Garth Richardson, who, you know, who's worked mm-hmm. with Melvin's Sick of It All, Rage Against the Machine. Oh, yeah. Was that a was that a weird time to, to peek behind the curtain of the major label world? You know, yeah, it was because you hear all the stories, you know, I mean, anyone yeah. that's a music fan, you grew up watching, you know, just watch VH1 behind the music. Right. Everyone, there's some horror story. We signed to a major and they tried to tell us what to wear and right. what songs to play and all that. We actually kind of went into our major label thing, just being brutally honest with the label and just we're like we're not going to do really anything you tell us to do like we're going to do a record uh-huh. we're not going to send you demos <laughs> like we're just going to record it and we we kind of got we got away with it damn i don't know how but there's no real horror story we went with garth and he's the sweetest guy in the world and he did that rage record we all knew about and he had done a sick sure. of it all record right you know and we, we had toured with sick of it all um and so they had good stories about Garth. They were like, yeah, he's awesome. And uh, they took the record and just put it out and they were pretty cool. And so uh, we got lucky. Right. But, you know, then our label folded shortly after we were on DreamWorks and it, that was kind of the time where a lot of the labels seemed to be kind of disappearing. Right. Maybe because like music was free. (laughs) So it's like. There's an undeniable correlation there. And I always tend to throw that in as well as for. Uh potentially making sort of the narrowing the scope of what a record label was even willing to risk on a band. So the sort of templates became more and more confined. Absolutely. And I think there's an unde- undeniable correlation between music, uh, the Napster thing happening, and then that happening. In my mind, there certainly seemed to be a correlation there. Yeah. So, you know, our label, Geffen, or DreamWorks, we were on DreamWorks, it turned into Geffen, but they were nice to us well. Right. When it came time to do do the next record, I guess that was the sufferer and the witness. Was it nice to get back working with the the Stevenson crew? Absolutely. It just felt like going back home. Yeah. Like I said, I got nothing bad to say about Garth. We had a great time. I mean, we went to this little island called Gibson Island. It's more of like a peninsula, but it's right near Vancouver, and it was beautiful. And we were like living in wow. we had this beautiful house and a studio there, and we like played frisbee golf. I mean, it was rough rough living oh it was <laughs> easy living yeah we yeah like, oh wait this is cool but when that record was over even though we had a good time with with garth you know bill and jason they're they're our buds right and they know what sounds we're looking for and yeah i think just the drum sounds and the guitar sounds and even you know embracing tim's voice you know his like blood curdling badass scream that, that he's always had um right you know bill just gets that and I think I know this for a fact, him and Tim have this connection over his lyrics that I think is very unique. Uh-huh. And I think, you know, we just felt like going back and that's one of my favorite records. So obviously it was a good decision, I think. Well, you know, what's interesting about it is the release date, to my understanding, was July 4th, 2006, making it my 30th birthday. Oh, wow. I was born July 4th, 1976. So you'll put that out on my 30th birthday. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, but that is a good sounding record. I was going back and sort of listening to them, the chronology of them, and thinking about sort of going back. And, and it's, a, it's a damn strong record. Y'all all yeah. really sound like you're hitting on all cylinders. And as you mm -hmm. said, it sounds like working with Bill and those guys just really is the icing on the cake. And yep. it's just a, a really good flowing scenario. Yeah, it was a fun one. Yeah. And uh, Chris Lord Algae mixed it. And nice. He did a few of our, our records and he just has this fat sound, this huge snare drum sound you right know, it's just epic so um as bill would always kind of joke like we'd go back to him for the snare because <laughs> he just had that, <laughs> that epic snare boom it's like a cannon so that's wild i know his name but I'm, I'm spacing a little bit on some of the other records that he's worked on he's worked on all he worked with green day on like a lot of their big stuff and you okay. name it tons of bands yeah he's definitely been around for a long time and his brother is kind of in the whole pop world. His studio's in like Miami and he does a lot of the pop stuff. Ah. So they're big, they're brothers. Yeah, they do a lot of stuff, so. That's wild. That's right, yes, yes. They're a team of brothers that are both uh, mixer, producer, engineer guys, I guess, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, That's he, wild. you go into his studio and there's like a Tina Turner platinum record on his wall. Like he helped produce her record. You know, he's, he's, done, it. he's done it all, yeah. Damn, dude. That's wild. Yeah. From Rise Against to Tina Turner. That's that's spanning a little bit of the gauntlet, huh? It was more from it was more <laughs> Tina Turner to Rise Against, but I don't know what <laughs> Yeah, I guess yeah, we're going I, chronologically. Yeah, I don't know what that means about <laughs> your career path, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think she's slightly bigger. She might be slightly more popular. Slightly. Yeah, just yeah. Tina who? Who is this Tina Turner character? Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Well, I know that Rise Against did some did a run, I believe, with the Foo Fighters, didn't you? We did. We did two of them. They took us to Australia, and we did New Zealand, and maybe we played a Tasmanian show there. Tasmania show, maybe. And then I think we did Singapore with them too. But then we did an American, a U.S. run, like Detroit, Chicago, like kind wow. of a Midwest thing. Yeah. How was it playing with them? I mean, they're a huge band, right? Massive. And they're very friendly. And the tour runs smooth and all of their people that they roll with are super friendly and inviting. And I mean, you hear stories about those guys being really nice guys because they're really nice guys. Right. I'm 43. So, I mean, you know, Nirvana hit when I was like in middle school and it's like, it's Dave Grohl. So, you know, <laughs> kind of cool. And Taylor, you know, Taylor's no slouch either, but it was cool 100%. to meet Dave Grohl and, uh, you know, he's such a cool drummer and he, he gets up once a night and plays like a song and Taylor will sing, at least on both those tours, they were doing that. I think they play like a queen song or something. Yeah. And the minute he gets up on the drum set, it's like, it's, there's something magic when he plays. Yeah. Like the drums sound big and they just, they sound, it's, it's like the myth is, I mean, it's not a myth. Like he really has this thing about him when he plays the drums, it just sounds kick-ass. No doubt. Really fun tour. I imagine then he was one of those guys that was likely influential to you. I mean, it sounds like you were playing drums a little bit prior to 1991, if I'm doing the math correctly. But yes. as you're in those formative years, you know, early 90s, 91, never mind comes out. So, mm -hmm. and then Smashing Pumpkins put out Gish, you know, Soundgarden yep. put out Bad Motorfinger. There's so many oh, killer yeah. records that came out in 91 alone. I talk about it ad nauseum. Oh, uh, Matt but, Cameron. Matt Cameron is oh. just he's one of my top favorites of all time. Yeah. He's amazing. And yeah. And that Nirvana record, it was neat because it was so different, right? It was so the drums yeah. were like in a way um, stripped down, uh -huh. but like so powerful and effective. But yeah, that whole record was a huge influence on me um, in utero too, you know, and incesticide, oh, yeah. incesticide. Yeah. All that stuff was killer. And Utero, especially because of how outrageously huge the drum production is on that. And yeah. it's also got like a little bit more of that Jesus Lizard noise rock kind of thing happen in it. Absolutely, yeah. I dig it because of that. I've I've heard some 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 people say previously, so I'm just kind of reiterating here that maybe that was kind of what that band was always supposed to sound like, you know? Mm -hmm. I think the 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 Nevermind production was was pretty slick and still had like the punk rock thing. It was certainly a template for a lot of things that would come. Butch Fig, it was a little... Exactly. Yep. But then you go to In Utero and it's like everything's like crank, noisy, wild, 
It's I, yeah. I, I that's the one that's the record that I probably listened to the most and revisit in Nirvana. Honestly. Yeah, it's it's more dirty. They went to Chicago to record that, and just like it, those sounds are so. You're right. It's it's way more dirty and cool. Yeah, I, I bet both records sound great. You know, absolutely. And then Matt Cameron. I mean, what can you say? It's just I never ever get over listening to those drum parts for sure man it's something that i've said about his playing was that even throughout like super unknown and and the following record the, i think he had one of he was one of the most capable drummers of playing sort of mm. any odd time signature stuff that could still be on the radio and i don't mm. know that many people would even notice if th that if that was the case i mean other than maybe alice a single alice and chain song there weren't many odd time songs that made it onto the radio but yeah. matt cameron whether it was a transition or a verse chorus something there was a lot of the times weird shit happening but man that oh, yeah. guy always found a way to make it groove we just had that conversation backstage like a month and a half ago i was sitting with zach and tim my two band members and we were watching a live it was soundgarden live like at a euro festival we had on our tv back there uh-huh that you were you were saying that he could kind of throw in these odd time signatures here and there but never break the flow of the song and never like you said not the listener wouldn't even necessarily know that he went into some odd time or fancy drum thing and that the yeah. ability to do that's huge right because most of the time yeah. you know to people that aren't familiar with time signatures or drumming like you throw them a curveball like that and it can like ruin the song for him or make him uncomfortable. Totally. They're like, wait, what's going on? But yeah, he had, <laughs> he had this ability to just put in the most creative drum parts, odd time stuff, weird, weird off time fills that didn't, you know, end on the one, just like weird stuff that drummers and are just like, Oh my God, that's so cool. That's so neat. But make it comfortable for the layman. Absolutely. It's just interesting. They're one of the only bands of that era that, were that big and had singles that were a like pretty long songs and had odd right. time signatures and people yeah. loved it and ate it up <laughs> yeah and i th think it's just because the songs were great you know there's no other there's no other reason except you know the choruses were huge dude can sing his ass off obviously. oh my god one of the greatest oh my god unbelievable you know the whole band i mean there's there's not a, there's not there's nothing nothing about that band I can't hate anything about that band. Yeah. No weak link. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's something else that I mentioned previously as well in regards to Chris Cornell, rest in peace, but totally. it's, it's about as rare as it gets that you have a good looking guy that could sing was a great front man, great songwriter and great lyricist. He was all that. I know. Like who the fuck does all that? That's why it's such a <laughs> shame what happened to him, you know, because oh man, bummer, you know, I, we, I was, fortunate enough to meet him on more than one occasion nicest guy yeah. ever yeah so talented and that voice i mean there's nothing like that there's nothing no nah, i know so you just wonder why but i know man i hear you crazy well as far as uh going forward man what do y'all have going on are there any tentative tours tours of the books anything is anything coming up what do y'all have happening we are going to start playing some shows um in like april okay um, we're still working out the kinks, so I, I don't know if I should talk about that. Yeah, but yeah I, I have hear a few you. more months. <laughs> I'm playing Chicago on the 10th of December. We're playing like a Christmas show. Nice at the Aragon. Okay, which is cool because back to my grandparents who are musicians in the 40s and 50s, they used to play the Aragon. Wow. And I have I have these show posters hanging up around my house of that says Will Back, Eunice Clark at the Aragon. Yeah, they used to play there, and it was one of the only clubs in the country that had air conditioning. It was like Whoa. this fancy, fancy ballroom back in the time, this legendary place. And I remember probably in like 2006 or seven, when I first played there, my grandparents were still alive. And I was like, I'm playing the Aragon. They were like, wow, it's just crazy. It's such a like legendary place. And so we still play there and play on their December 10th. And Amazing. So, yeah. It's like family tradition. It's awesome. hundred percent full circle. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. Yeah, man. it is full circle for sure. Awesome, man. Well, uh, damn, Brandon, it was it was fun talking to you, dude. I appreciate the time, and um, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to catch y'all coming through at some point or another. I'm I'm definitely ready to get back to getting out to shows and doing the whole thing. So I'll have to catch up with y'all at some point. Yeah, I hope you know this whole COVID thing goes away for good, and we can all keep going to shows, <laughs> going on tour. Fingers crossed, absolutely, man. Doing what we love. 
Seriously. Right on, man. Well, it was great talking to you, dude. Have a good, have good holidays, and uh, we'll catch up soon, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to Brandon for catching up. That's a wrap for this one. Another one in the books, as they say. We'll catch y'all on the next one. Crash, bang, boom. Boom.